Welcome to the Virtual Thoughts episode, video podcast episode number four or five. With me is Scott Register of Ixia. Scott, what do you do at Ixia? I'm a, I run a product management team here uh, on the visualization uh, group. Okay. Well, what we're going to talk about today is how testing needs to change to fit into the modern environment. When you start thinking about virtual, virtual and cloud environments and DevOps and all that, the traditional let's get a honking five million piece a big piece, five million dollars worth of test gear, throw it in the lab and test it, doesn't all happen all that much, right? So things well, have changed. <laughs> yeah, the the world is definitely changing. I mean that, uh, and obviously Ixia has a, a pretty rich history in test and measurement, but a lot of that testing methodology and mindset was built around hardware development, right? Before you release some massive router, firewall, whatever, you know, that that's a very staged, you know, kind of waterfall development process and you have big QA labs and you hook up lots of stuff and, and that's great, but it's not necessarily relevant for kind of a, a, an iterative software world where, you know, uh, software is never really finished. You know, you just keep <laughs> adding and adding and building. Exactly. Right? I mean, it's not like, especially you look at any web app, no one ever says that, you know, I don't know, Mint. What to just pick, you know, some web app. No one ever says, "Oh yeah, we're done. Well, we're not going to add any more features, right?" It's just an evolving process, and so yeah, it's like I'm done. Testing it. Yeah, they're not going to. Yep, I'm done. Let's. What's the next project now? Yeah, no, that, it's that'd like be great, right. No, but it doesn't happen that way, right? And so the the way that you do testing and you think about that about testing in that environment is very different, but it's still critical, right? I mean, it, especially when you you know you're dealing with personally identifiable information, you're doing e-commerce transactions, you're doing all this like really important stuff. Uh, and as we kind of move forward in the internet of things world and all of your you know, refrigerators and cars and whatever are connected, if the apps that they're talking to aren't tested, you could be in, in a bad spot, right? When uh, some system tells your car to exit, you know, 500 yards before the off ramp, that could be bad. So you do want to do some testing. It's just, it, it's harder to find those kind of clearly marked breakpoints in the, uh, in the well, process. I would agree with you. And I'm, I'm a developer, so I'm going, to, I'm going to speak from that perspective. When we develop code, we do testing as we go. What we call, it's called unit testing. We'll mm -hmm. test a function, we'll test a combination of functions, but we don't test the whole product. We'll end up saying, okay, we're done with our little bit, put it into the source code repository, and then from there, go off and say, okay, what's my next project? Right. Or the next update to that code. Um, when we do that, we don't integrate, we don't do integration testing. Now, there used to be integration testing, used to be beta testing, there used to be um, test labs, you speak QA, and then eventually after it got through all that and you iterate on the software to make sure it works, then you would put it out in production. Right. Today it's kind of like you code, you do your unit test, and you throw it out in production, and you're done. <laughs> yeah, no, that, that's true. And it, 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 it's funny you mentioned that. I mean, some a lot of our newer products are, are, are software, and even like I'll have uh, guys in the field ask, oh, can we have a beta? I'm like, you know, we're not really going to do a beta like that. It, it doesn't work that way uh, anymore. Although, you know, that that's interesting what you say about the kind of unit, you do the individual unit testing, but maybe not testing things as a whole. NASA has a great story about a, a Mars lander. Remember that where like one yeah. module was, was coded in like meters and the other was feet and both of them worked individually, right? But when you put them together, you plant, they planted their Mars lander like 30 meters underground, right? So that didn't work so well. But each of the ind each of the individual modules had been unit tested and worked correctly, right? Correct. What was missing was the integration testing. And that's the kind of thing that we hope to avoid. And so I guess what, you know, as we think about well, what does testing look like now, it's in some ways lighter weight uh, because it's not, you know, oh, in many cases what you'll do, I mean, you still do unit testing to your point. I mean, that I mean, it, it might change a little bit, but that concept is still around. But the way you do integration testing is going to be not at a big kind of long breakpoint in the process. It's something is moving to production. And so I'm going to do both some, some amount of pre-deployment testing, which should be automated and really easy to do and, and kind of cloud scalable. So if you want to do scale testing, you want to do functional testing, you can do it. And then it keeps going as you're in production, right? You're, you're probably rolling out your app 
and you've shown it to you're showing it to some subset of your customers and at the same time you're still doing some amount of, of testing right and either uh, you will find a problem or in some cases a customer will and you want to make yeah, sure you can identify they, that quickly and this is the thing they've pushed testing out off onto their customers and that's their beta test and when it passes that they go they do an a b test they send it out to a percentage of their customers and if it works they go and put it out to the rest of their customers so you got a subset that have that are beta testers, and they actually haven't even volunteered to be beta testers. They just right. are. And, I mean, I've done enough beta testing that, you know, this is something you volunteer for or you get paid for. This is not something you, as a customer, should be doing. Like, for right. example, I just got my Apple Watch, and I called up Apple and said, look, where's the instructions for turning on this feature? And they said, well, you have to, re you have to restart your watch. It's like, why? Why am I your beta tester? This should have been fixed beforehand. A watch is a watch is a watch. It tells time. Yeah. It gives notifications, beeps and things. You can't really mess that up too much, but they, they can and they have enough so that the only way to fix it was to repair everything and, redo, and, and, and not repair as in repair the watch, but pair it to a new Bluetooth sender. And it's like, uh, this just doesn't work. I don't want to be anybody's beta tester anymore. So I think that testing needs to move fully into the whole concept of infrastructure as code, that we deploy VMs now, we deploy containers with an app in it, with all the infrastructure you need to make it run. But part of that is the security settings you need that need to be controlled by the security team. I actually think that the test team now needs to be a part of this in creating a test infrastructure that uses the exact code base and becomes part of that deployment of continuous integration, continuous de deployment models for DevOps and so forth, that testing, if they have the code in the repository, it'll get run automatically as part of that. And if it fails, it goes back to say, hey, we can't release this. Right. Right, and that and that that also gives you a if you're thinking about it that way, I think one of the benefits is you can do both sort of functional and security testing at the same time because a lot of the security testing is like boundary testing and fuzzing and what happens if I get this input I'm not expecting, right? And that that goes to both functionality and stability and security, right? Because exactly if, if the software gets something it's not expecting, that's typically where you get an exposure, right? Whether it's escalation or crash or whatever or just a denial of service. And so if you're if you're automating that testing and you're doing it with the real code base, uh, then yes, absolutely, you, you can, it gives you that chance to find all kinds of things. So your security team may not be as distinct as it once was, right? I mean, it's just kind of code validation, but the, maybe the, the outcomes that you're looking for are certainly security uh, related. Well, it's not just security related. It's just that does this in, does this app work the way you expect it to? Right. Because you added a new feature. I mean, I have a customer that I deal with, and I talk about them a lot. They do two to three billion, well, closer to three billion requests per day. The volume that they have, they've never been out of test in their quote unquote development lab. Right. Not till not till now. And I mean, I'm trying out Ixia software to to actually give us some load testing. But this, I mean, you think about the Facebooks of the world, the Netflix of the world, it's almost impossible to load test that stuff in the lab. Right. They need yeah. to, but it's becoming more and more difficult. That's why they do A-B testing. They take a percentage and they get a billion queries per day or two billion, three billion, whatever it is. It's that volume of influx that's hard to duplicate. So just doing load testing, can it handle the load, is a plus. Right. Doing a... Security fuzzing is a plus. You know, all these things are pluses, but you've got to be able to do them. The modern developer is a DevOps guy in agile development. They're doing sprints. They write their code. At the end of the sprint, you're out, you're, your code's in production. Right. Yeah. Right, right. And uh, <clears throat> hopefully you even know when, it, when it's going live. But I think Right, to, to an earlier point about unit testing, um, and, and if you want to be able to test for scale, part of that means you're not just testing a module in isolation. You really want to do an end-to-end -end test, you know, from what does the end user see and like what's the, is the data that's coming back to them uh, correct? 
all the way through your back end, your you know, transaction processing, your database, et cetera, you want to make sure that you're testing that all the way through. Now, you're you're absolutely right. You can't you can't be Facebook size. I mean, it's gonna be hard to test, you know, that many hundred million users doing you know, whatever billion users doing something. But you if you know what a certain size of infrastructure will support. That's certainly very helpful in knowing. Well, I have to make sure I'm gonna, I, I can scale out to a certain size, right? So exactly. this slice of it can handle a million users, and I expect this many billion users. Well, I know how many of those slices I need. So at least you're able to do that, even if you can't test with your expected complete load of users, right? At least you know kind of to some degree how the system scales. And I think that expecting to be able to do it in a test is going to be impossible. I think you still need to depend on the system itself. You need to be able to depend on the system to be able to tell you what problems you're having. But this also leads to another part of testing that most people don't realize is that, I mean, Netflix does this with the Simian Army. They actually yeah. shut down things all the time. It's a great way of saying, hey, developers, hey, production, if this fails, this is a bad thing. The right. But they also monitor all that. But the the key is is that we need to get to a point where for these web scale, large scale apps, that we are doing production level operational testing to see if it actually is behaving the way it should be from a well known source. And also looking at how we get the queries in to see if any of those queries should be put back into our test for regression. Because right. they could be causing problems. So we gotta tie our testing somehow to the operations which is also, should also be tied to deployment. And I think we need to get to the point where this is all pick, it's picking up new and uh, maybe obscure cases to make to be pulled back into the test suite. Right, it's, which means that your code has to be uh, instrumented in a way that you're learning enough, even like when in, whether it's during testing or during runtime, you're learning enough about the transactions that you can both identify an error when it occurs, like, oh, I've got a problem here, and also see what caused that, right? Because if it was a particular, you know, could have been a user query, could be some combination of events, you want to be able to re, uh, recreate that, right, in your, in your test environment. And so when you have your automated regression testing, you want to do that. Again, that means you have to know what caused that error conditioning. So your, your code has to be instrumented well enough that, when you're doing your forensics, I mean, which, which still applies, you can reproduce that scenario, right? What cause, I, I see the error and I can see what caused that error. Now let me bring it back into my test system and every time I do a new release, that's part of the automated, you know, that's part of the automated regression test, right? Is exactly. Test, do that query again and see if, see if it blows up or if it stays together. And I think that's where some analytics will have to come into play because I, eventually testing should be as automated as possible where the human's effectively out of the picture. They push the button to do a deployment. The, the automation tool, whether it's Jenkins, Vagrant, Ansible, Puppet, or Chef, goes off and calls the infrastructure's code piece to create the virtual machines or create the containers that the application is put in, place the application in there, start it up in the right sequence, and then at that point says, oh, I'm not deploying it yet, let me test it. Right. Let it test, if it fails, it needs to feed back into the ticketing system, and if it's critical enough, it's like, okay, we gotta stop the deployment get it fixed before we can deploy. But at the same time, if it does go to deployment, that pickup of these errors, those performance metrics need to be in an automated fashion so that they can feed back into those right. that automated test. I expect envision that in the future you put the humans are going to just push a button and it's just going to take care of it all unless there's a major exception. Right. And that's and yeah, so your your test suite then becomes the kind of a the union of sample kind of positive queries and all of the things in the past that have caused problems, right? Exactly. So if you can get to through some good cases and all the places where you've seen problems before, then it's okay to go live, right? Exactly. Uh, and it, I guess the benefit of the, the more modern deployment model where you have multiple versions deployed at once is, you know, you're, you're not held up. It, let's say you find a problem, it's not like your whole system is, is offline, right? If you've got something that's stable, it may be missing some features that you had planned to release, but when you see, oh, I've got something that will keep me from deploying, 
you're not offline. You're just, it's just that your users aren't getting the benefit of those new things that you would have added, right? And so exactly. You fix those and, and roll it out. And if they're, they're critical to the performance of the company or a loss of revenue because the new feature's not there, that means that you're going to actually start fixing those bugs a lot earlier in the system, and you may actually be testing them in integration as part of your de um, development. Development testing is going to become more robust. Right. If I can automate all that and the developer doesn't have to get his, to actually be personally involved, yeah. I mean, this is, this, this is a good thing. Right, and that's why, like, for, for us, when we're developing, like, our, our test systems, our visibility systems, uh, automation has been pretty important for us for a while. Like, being able to drive everything through some kind of published, you know, standard interface where you basically feed in, you know, XML, and that will drive a, a test, right? And so you don't need to sit at a keyboard necessarily and build something from scratch. You can take, to some degree, you know, the, the results of, of other testing or here's what a traffic profile looked like or whatever and feed it in and have that run without ever touching a uh, keyboard. Now this, you know, why did we develop it? It wasn't for this environment. It was really going back to the, the equipment manufacturers, right? Who needed yeah. to run multi-day and multi-week, you know, bake tests of new devices and run them under max load and all this stuff and, and have all these automated tests because someone isn't going to sit there until 2 a.m. and wait for the, that test to finish and then click go, right? So, but those same principles turn out to be very handy now. So if you wanna do automated software testing, that concept of having an API that you just feed the right information into and run the test applies very well. It's just that you're testing with different application parameters or different queries or user geographies or whatever it is that you want to, to vary, right? It could be something mobile specific, application specific, whatever, you just feed that in and rerun your tests and it's completely automated, right? So Ab it's, absolutely. it's very convenient that that, that same principle is, is still useful. And it, and it absolutely is. Well, thank you very much, Scott. This has been Virtual Thoughts. And if you want to look up Ixia, you can go www.ixiacom.com mm -hmm. and um, look at the Breaking Point VE product, the virtual environment product, as well as some of the other ones, IX Chariot, I believe, and IX. Yes. Um, IX Chariot, there's some very good tools there. Yes. Uh, thank you very much for joining us. My pleasure. Thanks for your time.